Before we get to this week's episode, I'd like to remind you all that my book, The Anxious Person's Guide to Non-Monogamy, is available through most major bookstores. It would be lovely if you would purchase it through the Jessica Kingsley Publishers website. Just do a little Google. It's a great book for people brand new to non-monogamy or people who have tried it for a while and need a little bit more structure. You can head to nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash book for more details and to show an interest in the audiobook, which would be really, really helpful to me. If you've bought it and read it, please give it a rating or review on Amazon. If you don't mind, that's also very helpful. Thank you so much for your support. Let's get to this week's episode. Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous, or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 94 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send your questions to nonmonogamyhelp at gmail.com and they'll either be read in the column or the podcast anonymously. If you would like to read the columns and listen to the podcast, you can do so at nonmonogamyhelp.com. Subscribe to the email newsletter by going to go.nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash email and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at nonmonogamyhelp. If you want to support the columns and the podcast, please consider becoming a patron. Even $1 a month helps to support the daily running of the columns and the podcast, and it shows me a general vote of support. You can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix. If you donate $5 or more a month, your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast. Now, let's get to this week's discussion question. If this is the first episode you're listening to, every week before I read the letter, I put forth a discussion question that you can use with your friends, partners, mentors, anyone you want to get to know a little bit more. I also answer it myself briefly to give you a little bit of context. This week's discussion question is, what do you know triggers you in relationships? I think for me, I definitely feel like in the beginning of relationships or even before they start, I feel like I'm way more apt to feel jealous or feel scared before a relationship even starts because I can't help but to see it as a competition. And I know logically that it's not as simple as it being a competition, but I can't really help that. And I am a very flexible person, I am a very adaptable person, and I don't necessarily mind adapting myself somewhat to a partner, and I have to be a little bit careful of that because, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I can be a little bit too flexible, I can be a little bit too adaptive, and... I can go with things, not necessarily things I don't want to do because I don't think I'm that much of a people pleaser, but I do think that it becomes hard when I don't have that anymore. And yeah, it's, but I don't think that is necessarily something that I can completely get rid of. I just feel like it's very human to want relationships. It's very human to want a bond with someone and not having that is understandably going to make you feel sad and understandably going to mean that you feel a certain way. And I feel like sometimes we're a little bit too much of like everyone needs to be super independent and I don't necessarily think that that's always the case. I think it's a delicate balance, but yeah, I think that definitely in the beginning, just trying to see if somebody likes me or not, I definitely have a lot more anxiety, a lot more jealousy, a lot more fear. And it's not to say I don't have these things during relationships by any means. I'm definitely not like 100% got it all figured out and no problems whatsoever. But I definitely think that the beginning is when I struggle a lot more usually. We'll see. You never know what life can throw at you. Anyway, that's the discussion question. Let's get to this week's letter. I've been in a monogamous relationship with the love of my life since I was uh, about 16, so 23 years. And um, last year we opened our marriage um, mostly because of my my request and, and wanting to enrich our relationships and really try to, you know, deeply bond. I think we developed a very um, codependent relationship growing up because we didn't really have um family systems modeled to us that were 
you know, that taught us any other way. So we kind of created our own way. And um, I think that as it, as it happens, um, um, non-monogamy can also expose some pretty incredible trauma. And um, we both realized that our trauma is um, pretty overwhelming. And the irony is that my trauma is triggered by my partner um, opening up the relationship with other people because of, of deep, deep abandonment fears. And his trauma is actually triggered by not being able to have those relationships with other people. And so we're kind of in a conundrum because I love him so deeply. I was just wondering if you think that there's any hope for the two of us uh, being in a non, non monogamous relationship when we are triggering each other's traumas constantly and I feel like I'm dying right now and I know all about attachment and regulation and everything and I'm just working really hard but I just I don't feel a lot of hope and I really want to make this work and I really want to be able to find myself and be secure in my own life and I want that for him too. So I just wondered if you had any tips or ideas for how we might be able to work through that. Thank you. Before we get to this week's answer, I'm going to quickly plug this episode sponsor, BetterHelp. Quite often in a lot of my columns and podcasts, I encourage people to seek a polyamory-friendly therapist, and for a lot of people, looking locally for a therapist who may be supportive or understanding of polyamory can be impossible or out of their budget. BetterHelp allows you to find therapists online that you can send messages to at any time of the day, and they do offer some financial aid. You can get 10% off your first month by using the promo code NONMONOGAMYHELP at checkout, or you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash NONMONOGAMYHELP help. Let's get to this week's answer. Firstly, I want to say that I'm really, really sorry that you're going through this. I can obviously tell by the sound of your voice that this is incredibly upsetting and incredibly difficult. And yeah, I'm sorry that you're going through this. There's no other way I can kind of express that other than I'm really, really sorry. The first thing that I thought of when I listened through your question is relationships are triggering in general. It makes sense that they are going to be triggering. I don't know what your partner is feeling in terms of this, but you're not going to find a relationship that doesn't awake something in you. And that is for anyone, whether or not they really identify with having quote-unquote trauma or not. It makes a lot of sense that relationships can stir things up in us. We are relational creatures, we grow up in relationships, we survive because of our relationships, and we have very, very strong instincts to have relationships, maintain them, and for a very big part of our overall development as a species, if we were excluded from our group, we were dead. So it makes a lot of sense that a lot of the issues that we deal with are pretty much relational. That makes sense. So if you and your partner are thinking that non-monogamy itself is going to be the issue, I think that obviously it does bring up certain things, as you mentioned, but any relationship is going to be quote-unquote triggering. And even though you tell me that your partner's trauma is quote-unquote activated, or I can't remember the specific word you used, by not being able to explore non-monogamy, which I guess for him he has some sort of commitment issue or a little bit maybe a FOMO thing, something about missing out on that I don't necessarily think that that is just going to instantly be solved by being non-monogamous, just like you being monogamous wouldn't necessarily instantly solve any of your issues. So that's one thing that I think would help ground you both, is that the issue here is not necessarily just a simple matter of opening the relationship, but that 
any relationship you pursue, even if you were to break up, would likely continue to trigger that problem. The issue isn't necessarily you being together, although obviously I don't have the full info of what's going on within your relationship. If you are happy relationally with one another, if you enjoy your time spent together, and you see this being issues, regardless of whether or not it's you two together, then I do think that that can be somewhat of a grounding thing for us to realize that relationships are triggering regardless of what type they are and you can't necessarily escape that. The thing that I'm kind of wondering about the trajectory of your relationship and what might be worth thinking about because I I very much disagree with the idea of closing relationships to solve problems. Quite often I think that people are monogamous, they open their relationship, it doesn't go exactly the way that they planned, so they close it to fix the problem, quote unquote. And it doesn't fix the problem because they essentially have to learn how to solve the problem whilst they're in the relationship. I really wish I understood cars and how it worked, but let's say that like something, your engine light wasn't turning on or was turning on, or something was happening whilst a car was running and you brought it into the mechanic and they just decided to keep it off and never turn it on. Well, if the problem is happening whilst the car is on, then you probably have to keep it on in order to see what the problem is. So I don't always necessarily agree with closing the relationship. I think sometimes that just delays the inevitable. And sometimes I think that creates this cycle where Opening the relationship causes a lot of fear, causes a lot of anxiety. People aren't prepared for that. They close the relationship, the anxiety goes away because technically the threat that caused the anxiety is now gone. But then when you open it, it's right back there again. It's kind of like, you know, when you have a tattoo, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the thing I know about. If you have a tattoo and you have a little bit of a break, it doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the tattoo is not going to hurt. So I don't think that that is... A helpful thing. However, in your specific case, what makes me really wonder is that you said that your relationship was codependent. And I don't know if that's your personal definition or how your partner feels about it, but it makes me really wonder that if you think your relationship is codependent, that to me means that there is a problem foundationally with the relationship that you're in. And if there's a problem foundationally within the relationship you are in, would you decide to have a child? Would you decide that that was a good time to start a family? I think that sometimes people think that opening a relationship is not as big of a deal as a child, but actually it kind of is sometimes. Having a child and introducing a child into a relationship, whether through adoption or any other means, is a, is a relationship stressor. That's not to say that it's a bad thing, but it is something that stresses the relationship because it changes your lifestyle. It changes how you have previously related together and it redefines a relationship in a lot of ways. Opening your relationship is also a stressor. So when you already have a foundation that is not a way that you would prefer it to be, I assume you don't want your relationship to be codependent, I'm not sure why opening it would then be a good idea. Now, it may be that you didn't really think about that at the time. It seemed like a good idea, yada, yada. It wasn't necessarily that opening the relationship would quote unquote solve the codependency. But I do think that if both you and your partner considered your relationship before you opened to not be great or to have some foundational problems, then you have those foundational problems and you will have them whether or not you are open or not. And that is something that needs to be worked on. My question is, I can absolutely understand if you both want to be together and if you both see a future with each other and you both want to work hard to be together because not all relationships are happiness and rainbows. And, and and as much as I do believe in relationships absolutely fulfilling your life, that doesn't mean they don't take work. And that doesn't mean there aren't downsides. And I'm sure you know that. If you both are looking at this as a part where you need 
to work together to make things better? Is he willing to work on those problems or is his solution just, I have to open this relationship up because it not being open is triggering my anxiety or, or triggering my trauma, whatever that specifically means. I'm not quite sure what exactly that specifically means. And the thing I kind of worry about a little bit is that, and I'm not saying your partner is doing this, but I do worry that in just saying things like this is triggering my trauma, like I wish to be more specific about what that means because just because something causes us to have a reaction doesn't mean we are beholden to that reaction. And it doesn't mean we have to basically act in a way that appeases that reaction or else. So is your partner willing to work on this with you? And is your partner willing to work on this whether or not you are open or not? I'm not going to say whether or not you should stay open or not because there's a lot of other things to consider, but I would be really, really concerned if this was clearly an issue and it was an issue before we opened and I had a partner who was more concerned with making sure their trauma wasn't being quote unquote triggered than fixing the original problem with the relationship that was there before you opened, which was that you were codependent according to your own description. If you initiated the opening of the relationship, there's no reason for him to necessarily believe that you wouldn't be interested in that again. I could understand if he initiated the opening and then you f had a, an understandable freak out for whatever reason, and then you asked to close and he didn't want to because you maybe don't want non-monogamy and that can cause a lot of issues there. But he didn't initiate it from what you said. You initiated it. So there's a reason to trust that even if you are focusing more on repairing your relationship together than trying to get new dates, that this might change in the future. Maybe you don't have to decide whether it's open or closed right now, but you do need to decide if you're going to actually devote some time into addressing this issue. And if your partner is a little bit more concerned with spending nights out on dates than committing to working together on this, then I would be a little bit concerned. I'm also concerned a little bit with the story that you're telling yourself because I see this happen quite a lot in non-monogamy communities and sex positive communities in queer communities. I see Basically, people creating a narrative of themselves that perpetuates a type of learned helplessness. And there's a really great account, if you are on Instagram, uh, called Your Dying Nonsense, and it's uh, a psychologist named Todd. And he has some really great posts about attachment theory and about how basically abandonment as an adult is not the same as it is for children. When we are children, we rely on adults to take care of us. Therefore, we can be abandoned because we rely on them for survival. As adults, we don't rely on them for survival. And all of our adult relationships are inherently insecure because the adults in them can leave at any time, which is their right. So creating this story that you are a traumatized person that is being triggered by abandonment, I wonder if that is necessarily helping you because it might just be characterizing you as an entire person by something that is probably a result of how you grew up or what you've been through and creating an entire identity around that or, or telling that to yourself as a story repeatedly might be keeping you back a little bit. I'm not saying that this isn't happening to you. I'm not saying you don't, yeah, I'm not saying that abandonment isn't something that makes you feel afraid or the idea or perception of being abandoned, but I want you to think about maybe paying more attention to the story that you're telling yourself because sometimes in telling yourself a certain story, you are sometimes limiting yourself in terms of your response. And I know personally that the expectation that I'm going to feel jealous or when I have had partners that treat me as though I'm this sort of delicate, 
button that, you know, if it gets pressed, it's going to explode. I hate being treated that way because the expectation that I'm going to be too emotional or have a problem sometimes already makes me feel uncomfortable. So I don't like telling that self, telling that story to myself. And I think it might be worth you thinking about that. Now, when it comes to what you can do, as I said, the biggest thing that matters is, is your partner willing to work on the problems that you have had since the beginning of your relationship? Are you both committed to being together for the long haul, however long haul that might be? And if you are committed to that, is your partner demonstrating through actions rather than through your fears that he is committed to that? Can you both maybe look for a couples therapist that you can go to to talk through some things? I think that there is a very bigger need here beyond just an advice columnist. I think that there is a need here for a therapist to talk through this story you're telling yourself about being afraid of abandonment. I have no doubts that you have a fear of being abandoned. I'm not trying to discount that. But I do think that even the quote-unquote healthiest person mentally deciding to try non-monogamy, even if they want to try it, I do very much think they will feel anxious. And I see a lot of times when it comes to trying non-monogamy, especially from the people who have initiated it, and especially from the people who want it, they often have the expectation that they will not have any struggle or difficult feelings. And when they do have those feelings, they feel immensely guilty and struggle with it almost more than the people who expect themselves to be anxious because they're the ones that initiated it and they have no idea what to do with the fact that now they are in it, they are really, really struggling. And really sometimes what it is is a false expectation of themselves in that they believe that they should, as a person who has grown up in a monogamous society, and I assume that you have, and if I'm wrong, I apologize, they expect that they should just be able to be non-monogamous with no issue and no feelings and no fears. And sometimes they over-assume that because they have issues and because they have fears, they can't do non-monogamy or that they're deeply flawed. When actually, I think that it's very, very normal and very, very, as much as I hate the word normal, it's very, very typical for people to experience fear of their partner leaving them in non-monogamy, fear of losing their partner. This is so freaking normal. So I wonder if you painting this picture of yourself, of someone who is terrified of abandonment, is this maybe a normal reaction to a person who has grown up in a monogamous-centric society facing the fact that they are not monogamous anymore and having to deal with that and cope with that? There are going to be people who take to non-monogamy like a duck on water and don't have very much fear. And I don't know what your situation is. Like, I don't know if you open the relationship and your partner happened to find partners really quickly, but you didn't. So maybe it's super easy for your partner to be mentally okay with it because they haven't had to see you go into a different relationship yet. So, but you have, and, and now it's all kind of hitting you in the face like a sack of bricks. I'm not sure, but... It's very, very normal for you to feel scared. It's very, very normal to be afraid of your partner leaving you, even if you're monogamous. It's very, very, very normal. And there's lots of reasons for that. I do have a 101 article on my site, nonmonogamyhelp.com. Also, my book, The Anxious Person's Guide to Non-Monogamy, goes through the process of what I call finding your anchor. And that is one of the beginning things that you can do that helps you ground yourself. And I also talk a lot about the fact that you are going to feel afraid. And sometimes the expectation that you shouldn't feel afraid sets you up for failure. So maybe you aren't necessarily someone who is terrified of abandonment. Maybe you're just a normal person who is experiencing a huge fear of losing their partner in a very understandable way. There's another thing I talk about in the 101 article that might be really, really helpful for you, especially if you very much identify as a person who's afraid of abandonment. 
generally speaking, and it'll be different for every single person because obviously everyone has their individual issues, most people are going to be afraid of losing their partner or they're going to be afraid of being replaced. And this is for a lot of reasons. Primarily, like I said, we live in a monogamous-centric society. Not only do we live in a monogamous-centric society, but we live in a society that tells us that we must compete to find the right partner. We must consume the right things. We must look a certain way. And that this whole process of finding a partner is a game that we must win. And we won't win it if we don't consume, consume, you know? And so that paints a picture and it's exactly why I find it really competitive and am really competitive at the beginning of relationships, as I said in the um, discussion question. But that whole setup really encourages us to create a hierarchy and monogamy can be the ultimate hierarchy, right? But the thing about a hierarchy and even when people create hierarchies within polyamory is that if you can be the queen on the top of the hierarchy, you can also be knocked down and replaced. And so it makes sense to feel a certain amount of threat by the idea of non-monogamy because the entire point of, you know, being on the top of that totem pole and being the the one who gets appointed is that you're the only one your partner has a romantic interest in. You're the only one your partner has sex with. And so when that becomes not true, that really sends the whole system into chaos. And your brain, which is programmed to help you survive, is programmed to keep you from being socially excluded, is programmed to literally, I mean, I don't know the exact scientific study, but look it up. When humans experience social exclusion, it activates the same centers in our brain as that pain does. We have very, very strong drives to be with a group and be with relationships to be in relationships. So it makes total sense that that in and of itself will cause you to be afraid. Further more to that, I personally believe that if you grew up in a situation or experienced a very long relationship where you didn't get the attention you need, you were abandoned at that point, then it makes sense for your brain to go, okay, the parent or caregiver, and this is specifically for parents, not necessarily for other long relationships. So I think sometimes it can have a similar effect depending on the culture. But if you have a parent that isn't giving you what you need as a child and is abandoning you, then your brain goes, hmm, okay, well, we need to survive. And what makes the most sense? If we do certain things, maybe we can keep that person around. Maybe the, the parent will pay attention. Maybe the parent will start to care. It makes sense for your brain to go to there instead of going, the parent will never support us and therefore we are hopeless. Because your brain's trying to survive. It's not going to tell you something that's just going to completely and utterly destroy you. There is usually a method behind madness and your brain trying to say, okay, there's something we can do to change the behavior of our caregiver. And sometimes that works. Sometimes, depending on the caregiver, if you do certain things, you will get attention. And that reinforces that. And that helps you survive in the moment. That helps you understand that there is something I can do. I don't have to give up. Not everything is hopeless. And that is much better than being completely and utterly hopeless. And so when you take that on into adult relationships, which as Todd Barad says, which I agree with, are insecure by nature because partners are grown adults, you're a grown adult. And if they don't feel that the relationship is working for them, they can leave and they should leave. Then you are going to believe that you can do something to prevent partners from leaving. And you can go through many relationships believing because it makes you feel better that if you do X, Y, Z, my partner will stay. If I do this, my partner will stay. And the culture that teaches you that you must compete reinforces this. If you do X, Y, Z, if you look X, Y, Z, if you consume X, Y, Z, you will be more attractive. Your partner will stay, blah, blah, blah. But the truth of the matter is, and what I talk about in the 101 and 102 articles, is that there is only so much you can do 
to keep someone in your life. Should you be a nice person? Yes, you shouldn't go up to your partner and tell them that they're ugly or something horrible. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, it's never your fault if someone, you know, leaves you, especially if you've been nasty to them. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that short of doing your best to be a partner who is devoted to, you know, giving the proper attention to the relationship, caring about your partner, being kind, showing them compassion, empathy, paying attention to them, you know, and you're probably already doing those things. You can't always control that. You can't keep your partner there. You could give them every bit of compassion and empathy and do everything by the books and never ever do anything wrong. You could take to non-monogamy like a like a duck on water and you could never have any jealousy whatsoever. That in and of itself is not a guarantee. And this is another reason that non-monogamy can be so triggering for lots of people is because the system that is given to us within monogamy is socially encouraged. It is with a script, a cultural script that tells you that if you do this, if you do this, this is this, you know, you get married, you have kids, you do all of these things. And that reinforces a sense of safety within you. That reinforces the idea that, okay, we've done this and now we're together and things are okay. When really that's not necessarily true. There's nothing about getting married that means that you're going to be together forever. There's nothing about having kids that means that you're going to be together forever. But because you're following a cultural script and because you have all of society going like, this is the right thing to do, you definitely have a sense of security there. When you're in non-monogamy, you have no such thing. You have no security there. You have to create that security within yourself and you are not given any tools to how to do that. You have to completely come up with that on your own. Of course you're freaking afraid. Of course you are. Why wouldn't you be? You're now doing something that you have no cultural script for. There are no romance movies about non-monogamy. There is literally nothing. You've spent most of your life probably imagining yourself in a monogamous relationship because that's what you've been told you should have. And then now you're trying something completely different. Of course you're freaked out about that. Of course your brain is like, oh my God, we're going to be left. This is everything against what we've been told that we're supposed to do. We're going to be left and alone and scared and I don't want you to be in a bad place. So I'm going to freak out so that you pay attention to this because this is new and I'm scared. Like, of course you're freaked out. So the thing that really, really helped me with this is releasing myself from the responsibility to keep anyone in my life. And that, again, doesn't mean that I am a dickhead to anybody. I still try to be a nice person because I want to be. I still do things for people. I still want to have good relationships. But I understand that the decision for someone to leave me romantically, the decision for someone to reject me, the decision for all of that is not something I can control by being good or as clementine morgan says uh, the problem can't be solved by me being good because the problem is not that i am bad if i said that correctly apologies to clementine if i paraphrase that horribly you can't fix the problem of your partner leaving you by behaving in a good way because that is not what controls that If your partner wants to leave you, if somebody wants to leave you, if somebody wants to reject you, there are lots of complicated reasons why they might do that. Yes, if you decide to call your partner names and spit on them when they haven't consented to that, they might leave, definitely. (laughs) And you can control your behaviors, you can control your actions, you can control how you treat your partners and how much energy and, and, you know, care and love you show them. But you can't ultimately control whether or not your partner decides to stay. That is their decision. And that is why adult relationships are insecure. Because your partner doesn't have to be there and doesn't require, you don't require your partner to be there to, you know, raise you as a child does. So really being able to understand that it's not your responsibility to keep someone around and that you can't fix that by behaving well is extremely 
relieving because the thing about this this survival mechanism in your brain is is that yes temporarily believing that you can control somebody's behavior relieves some of the stress in your head if you believe that you can attract the right person by just putting on a hat or doing something that makes you feel a hell of a lot better than feeling like it's hopeless But if you inherently buy into this belief that you can control whether or not somebody stays through your behavior, you can't do that without also blaming yourself for every time somebody else left. And that isn't helpful for your brain in the long term. Right now, your brain's just trying to survive. You're trying something brand new. And I mean, I don't know, maybe you did grow up in a non-monogamous household. I could be wrong, but... For the vast majority of us, we grow up in a monogamous-centric society that gives us a very specific cultural script of how we're meant to grow up and meet somebody and fall in love and do this, that, and the other thing. And when we don't follow that cultural script, we have to figure it out within ourselves how we define a milestone. What does it mean to be together? And so it makes a lot of sense that you would be afraid to be left or abandoned or for your partner to go and you've had this relationship for a long time you've mentioned that you describe this relationship as codependent so there may also be other issues there of course you're going to be afraid of losing this relationship but another thing that I share in my book that I also feel helped me a lot when it came to my own anxiety is when I'm anxious about something I'm not actually anxious about the thing that I'm anxious about So for example, if I'm anxious that I'm going to have an allergic reaction to something and my throat's going to close or something like that, I used to have really bad anxiety around that. I'm not actually anxious about that. And that seems crazy. Like, what are you talking about? Of course, it's my throat closing that I'm afraid of. What? What I'm actually anxious about is that I'm not going to be able to handle it. That's really at the core of the vast majority of anxiety is a lack of self-trust. It's, I'm not going to be able to handle this. And so when you are able, instead of trying to argue against the anxiety, which is why I feel like a lot of beginner non-monogamy help resources are unhelpful, is that what it tells you is like, tell yourself that you're unique and you're beautiful and there's nothing that another person can give that you can give because you are so special. And I think that that's great and that probably does help a little bit. But that isn't addressing the disease, that's addressing the symptom. The disease is that you, at a core, may feel like losing this relationship would be incredibly difficult for you to the point that you don't feel like you could be there for yourself or you don't feel like you could handle it. But actually, you've handled a hell of a lot of things. I'm pretty sure that from the the sound of what you've just said, You have dealt with a lot. And if you have any form of anxiety, then you definitely deal with a lot all the time. And part of the way that you can address anxiety in in a way that's actually helpful instead of trying to reason with it is to say to it, okay, but I've I've been here before. I've been through this before. And that can be extremely helpful. It doesn't mean that anxiety doesn't ever come up. Like you can, you can definitely be in situations and that's why I said relationships are triggering regardless because you're definitely going to feel scared. You're not going to just suddenly be unafraid. And if you're expecting that of yourself before you open or to be perfectly happy all the time, I think that that's not fair on yourself to expect all the time. But you can get to a point where when you are afraid, then you know how to sit with the emotion, let it pass you, and it doesn't have to upend everything. And that comes with time, and that comes with therapy in my experience. So to sum up, first things first, if you or your partner are expecting relationships to not quote unquote trigger or upset you, I think that you are unlikely to find a relationship that doesn't. So this being something that is upsetting you both isn't a reason to give up. Second thing is that if you've described your relationship as codependent before you opened your relationship, I think that it's worth recognizing from you both that foundationally you have an issue. And that needs to be fixed whether or not you describe your relationship as open or not. 
Third thing is I really hope that your partner is willing to work on that foundation. Are you committed to each other regardless of the definition of your relationship? Are you committed to each other? And if you are, can you both make steps towards maybe finding a couples therapist, maybe talking about some of your issues. I do kind of really feel like there's a couples therapist needed here. I don't think that this is a problem that might be able to be solved by you both because it seems like you both are really upset. So I think that if you're both willing to pause things for a bit, and I normally don't re- don't say that that would be a good idea, but I think that If you initiated the opening of the relationship, then there's no reason to feel like you would always want it to be closed. And if you can work on a compromise, maybe you pause things for two months or after a certain number of sessions with a therapist. I think that if you're both willing to work towards opening and you're both willing to work towards strengthening the foundation you have with each other, then that's a really good sign. I think you need to pay attention to the story that you're telling yourself. Maybe follow your dying nonsense on Instagram and really think about how you're telling yourself certain things and how that might be limiting to you. And last but not least, you can check out the 101 and 102 articles on my site, nonmonogamyhelp.com. I also have the Anxious Person's Guide to Non-Monogamy, which has very clear exercises for people just starting out that might be really helpful for you. And release what you can't control. Release the expectation on yourself to keep not only your partner around, but anybody in your life. And that is really scary. But when you understand that there's only so much you can do, it is also super freeing. And it will also help you, I think, more so in the long run than trying to convince yourself of your uniqueness as how some non-monogamy resources kind of instruct you to do. So yeah, those are my kind of overall points. And again, like, I'm so sorry to hear that you're going through this. I really hear the devastation in your voice and I really hope that you're able to find, maybe check out BetterHelp, you're able to find a couples therapist that can really work with you too. Because I think if you're both committed to making things work, then you'll definitely get there. It could be that you are incompatible eventually, but you never know. And I think that if you're both willing to work at it, then I think you should make a go of it and take things one step at a time. Try not to decide everything all at once. And yeah, I hope that helps and good luck. Thank you for listening to episode 94 of Non-Monogamy Help. If you want to be awesome, you can donate to our Patreon. Donating $5 or more with your name means that it'll be read at the end of the podcast. You have to tell me your name because I'm not just going to say it on the podcast because I want your consent and all that. This week's current patrons are... Laura Boylan, Chris Alperi Jones, Juke Allen Robertson, Nikki Jones, James Wartell, Leo Yaki, and Tyler Tigno. If for whatever reason you can't become a patron because I get it, life happens. If you can take five minutes, log into iTunes, find the podcast, rate, and review it, that would be very, very helpful. It helps me get the podcast out there to new people. Apparently, you can also do so on Spotify, though I have not seen that, maybe because I'm not in the U.S. And please let me know if you've rated or reviewed it, especially if you've reviewed it. I have like I have a thing to tell me when someone has reviewed the podcast, like an automatic thing, but I don't always get, um, I can only do like three countries with that. So please let me know if you've done a podcast review and what country you're in, like tweet me at, at nonmonogamyhelp or send me a message on Instagram because the reviews are really nice to read and it's really helpful. And thank thanks to everyone who has written a review. It's been so amazing to read them and yeah, it's, it's kind of a, wow, I can't believe that this podcast is something that more than just me listens to sometimes. So yeah, thank you all for this week. You will get a new column next Friday and another podcast episode in a fortnight. Thank you again for listening. You've been listening to Non-Monogamy Help. Our podcast music has been provided by Chris Albury Jones at albury-jones.com. And the art was made by Dom Jung at d-o-m-d-u-o-n-g.com. Thank you for listening. I bumped the mic so many times during that episode, and I am so sorry. It's awful. And I just had to listen through it, and I'm so sorry. Okay, that's all I have to say.